Hello YouTube, this is Douglas, and welcome to my third voxel rendering engine devlog. In this episode, I'll be discussing the investigations that I've conducted over the past month concerning voxel mesh modification and algorithmic performance. When we left off in the previous episode, I had added textures and lighting to my ray marching renderer. The scenes were static, however, and I wanted to give the user the ability to update the chunk in real time, perhaps by digging holes or placing objects. Now, for compression and rendering purposes, I store my data in a sparse voxel octree, or SVO. The initial generation of the 256 cubed SVO displayed on screen involves building a flat array for every voxel in the scene, assigning each voxel a material that dictates its appearance. Then. This array is iterated over to build the SVO. Even for this simple mesh, the initial generation takes 500 to 1000 milliseconds. This means that the naive approach to editing the scene, which would simply be regenerating the SVO by inspecting every voxel upon modification, would be much too slow. As such, I developed an efficient algorithm for dynamic octree modification that takes advantage of the octree structure to minimize computational effort. Here's a simple overview of how the algorithm works. It's based upon the standard principle of divide and conquer. We have two voxel meshes, represented by voxel octrees, that we want to combine. The first octree is the target, which will be modified, and the second octree is the source, from which data will be copied. The goal is to overwrite the target's voxels with the source's voxels, but in any place where the source has empty space, retain the original target voxels. This is sort of like pasting two transparent images on top of one another. We begin by asking ourselves whether the target is completely enclosed by the source. If so, we check to see if the source is a homogeneous octree with a single level and single material. In this case, we can simply overwrite the target with the source's homogeneous value, because that material from the source completely covers the target. Otherwise, we split our target octree up into its eight suboctants and repeat this procedure on each suboctant. Similarly, if the source octree only covers part of the target, we divide the target into eight pieces and call the procedure for the octants with which the target overlaps. This way, we essentially make use of the octree structure and the knowledge it gives us about homogeneous regions to avoid wastefully merging individual voxels that share the same attributes. This algorithm is guaranteed to terminate because eventually the target will just be a single voxel, overlapping with one singular homogeneous voxel from the source. After three days of work, I was finally successful in getting the algorithm working. My initial write-up of the algorithm was rather messy. You can see on screen how long the function is, and I even used go-to statements, something that you almost never want to do. In the near future, I'll return to clean up this code. I implemented the ability to place trees in game with it, and on screen you can see the effects. I hadn't forgotten, however, about my initial reason for all of this. Performance. I wanted to see exactly how my voxel engine performed, so I quickly ran some benchmarks, and then tweaked the algorithm to remove some final inefficiencies. One of the main improvements I came up with was optimizing certain calculations for the position of a voxel in an octree. Since octrees are split into multiple levels, it's important that we're able to determine which octant a voxel is in at any level. What's quite elegant is that a voxel's 3D coordinates at the nth level are actually just the three binary digits in the nth digits places of its coordinates. So, for example, if we wanted to know the level 1 octant for the voxel at 101, 111, and 110, it would just be 0, 1, 1. To compute these coordinates, bitwise operations are necessary. I had to perform a logical ZOR between the vector coordinates, so for optimizations I switched to using x86 SIMD intrinsics, special CPU instructions that can perform math on entire vectors at a time. Running the benchmarks again, I found that the algorithm would place the tree in the center of this scene at about 11 milliseconds per iteration on my PC. This was acceptable, I thought, as the algorithm wouldn't be running every frame, it shouldn't affect frame rates. 
I also decided to benchmark my algorithm for generating SVOs from flat voxel arrays and found that it took 80 milliseconds per iteration, mainly due to memory accesses. Still, I wasn't satisfied. Having made all of the technical improvements that I could think of, I decided to try re-implementing the algorithms in a lower level language to see if they would be faster. That's right, it was time for some C++. I was both happy and disappointed to see that the C++ versions of my code ran twice as fast as the C-sharp versions. The voxel modification algorithm ran at about 5 milliseconds per iteration, and the generation algorithm at 40 milliseconds. For one, it's definitely beneficial to have an algorithm twice as fast, but at the same time, it's too bad that the C-sharp common language runtime isn't even close. I would have expected the results to be more similar, especially since modern versions of .NET Core and c -sharp use a fast, just-in-time compiler. One explanation is, is that extra safety checks from c -sharp, like out-of-bounds checking, slowed down my code. However, most of my c -sharp code was written using unsafe pointers, almost in a one-to-one -one correspondence with, c with the C++. Therefore, I'm more inclined to believe that there's an innate performance differential between the runtimes. Thank you for joining me on this coding adventure. In the next devlog, I plan to showcase some new techniques that I've created which mix rasterization with ray marching to take full advantage of the standard graphics pipeline. Before the video ends, I just wanted to thank everyone for all of the support and kind comments on my previous two devlogs. The channel is already at 75 subscribers. I'm happy to see that others are interested in my project and will continue to do my best posting updates when I can. In the meantime, please make sure to leave a like on this video and consider subscribing. Further, if you have any thoughts or questions, please leave a comment down below. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.